As we travel through the Bible together, we learn there's something special and important about last words. And today, we'll hear about the last words Jesus said as he ascended into the clouds above Jerusalem. There really are no more important words ever spoken. Welcome to Through the Bible. We're about to dive in along with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, to one of the most important passages in the New Testament. Acts 1-8 records Jesus' marching orders for the church, and that includes you and me. Acts 1-8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In this study, we'll see those witnesses move out into Judea and Samaria when Stephen became the first martyr and there was huge persecution against the believers in the New Jerusalem church. When you learn about these new followers of Jesus giving up their lives, don't think that Satan won the day. Many times in history, persecution actually furthers the gospel. It may seem counterintuitive, but it's true even today. If you're a part of the World Prayer Team, then you know about this. In a very serious and wonderful way, we're obeying Jesus' Acts 1-8 command to take the gospel into every country on earth. And what we find as we read letters from those hard-to-reach countries, that it's often where there is the greatest opposition to the gospel, that there is also the greatest turning to Jesus Christ. Have you heard the new things God is doing in the Arabic-speaking world, for example? Well, believe it. Here are just a few letters to illustrate the great things that God is doing, things that we're praying for as well. Jafar in Syria writes, Dear brothers, I would like to express how your program affects many lives. As I am a person who met Jesus through your teaching a long time ago, I cannot imagine my life without God's word. I consider it my daily friend with whom I sit and from whom I learn from God. May your program continue and may it bring the good news of salvation to many hearts. And now from Madi in Lebanon, we hear this. I start my letter with many thanks and warm wishes for your team. Through the Bible in Arabic is one of the most effective, life-changing, and soul-growing programs. I am sure that many people are being transformed because of the relay of truth. May the Lord bless you and give you all the support you need to keep going and help you be a lighthouse for the lost. And then Raid in Iraq says, After many years of being lost in the world and its sins, I've found you and found Jesus through your program. I am now his son, and he's my Savior and Lord. I wanted to let you know that and also share with you that I cannot stop talking about Jesus Christ to whomever I meet. Pray for me to continue in God's strength and safety. Well, do you want to be a part of what God's doing in the Arabic world today? Well, pray. Pray right now for these precious people and many more like them who are standing for God in what's a very dark world. And we'd love to have you support us in your prayers regularly by joining our world prayer team at ttb.org forward slash pray. And now let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for just a glimpse of your hand at work, bringing those who were once far off and opposed to you to yourself. We intercede for those, Lord, now who courageously listen to this glorious good news that you would give them the faith to believe. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you once again would fill us with understanding of your word and your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we've come to a new section, actually the second major division that we have in the book of Acts. You'll recall the Lord Jesus says, Ye shall be witness unto me in Jerusalem. Then he said, in Judea and Samaria. Now from chapters 8 through 12, we have the Lord Jesus Christ at work by the Holy Spirit through the apostles in Judea and in Samaria. Now we left off last time with a most unusual scene. We saw two young men, both of them together, I suppose had the greatest influence upon the early church. The first one that's mentioned is Stephen the deacon, the young man that gave up his life, the first martyr in the church. And the one that had charge of his stoning was a young Pharisee by the name of Saul. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And that means that he had charge, that he was there taking the lead in it. He was the cheerleader in the cheering section. And this young man, now Saul of Tarsus, 
he's amazed when he sees the face of Stephen and see him looking into the heaven, says that he sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And young Saul looked up. He didn't see anything, but friends, he wish he could. He will a little later. Stephen is the one, I think, that prepared him for the appearance of the Lord Jesus to him on the Damascus Road later on, which we'll see. Now we have here in the first four verses, we see that Saul becomes the chief persecutor of the church, and then the church is scattered. Actually, he did the church a favor. They were settled upon their lees in Jerusalem, and they, I don't think, would have moved out had it not been for the persecution. And Saul of Tarsus led in that. I'm reading now chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now Judea and Samaria were the second territory they would go into. Judea surrounded Jerusalem, and Samaria was to the north. Now will you notice verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. This, I think, is a design or a picture of a Christian burial. There is today the question that comes to us right along, well, should Christians be cremated? There's nothing in the Bible particularly against it. You wouldn't lose your salvation if your pot is cremated, that is for sure. But the method of burial for a Christian is to, it's like sowing seed. It's like putting someone in a motel and putting them to sleep. That's the way Paul speaks of it in 1 Thessalonians, speaks in 1 Corinthians 15, so that you don't burn seed when you plant them, and you don't actually burn a person when you put them in a motel. At least you're not supposed to. There have been some bad hotel and motel fires, but that's not the proper way. And I would say that you give a testimony and a burial by taking a body, and this body of Stevens must have been horribly mutilated, and they took him up tenderly, and they put him down in the ground, just as you'd plant seed, put him, as it were, in a motel. The body's gone to sleep. Stevens has gone into the presence of Christ who was waiting up there for him. But one day that body will be raised, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown in weakness, raised in strength. Now, I can't see how cremation sets that forth. Here's the picture of real Christian burial. Now, I know that today the many of the undertakers say, well, we're running short of space. My friend, this old earth has been taken in bodies now for thousands of years, and still there's room. Is it the writer to the Proverbs? Our Ecclesiastes says that the grave never says enough. It's always moving in that direction. And I still believe this is the proper way for Christian burial. Now, let me move on, because that is actually a sidelight, and the reason I spent time with it, that's a question that comes to us constantly, and apparently today it must be a pretty live issue in some areas. Now, verse 3. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Now, this is the young man now with zeal, as you remember he said concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was a very zealous young man. Now, will you notice, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now you see the effect of the persecution actually did not hinder the church. It furthered the work of the church. Paul said to the Philippians when he was put in prison in Rome, he said, the things that have happened unto me have happened for the furtherance of the gospel. And I just don't believe that the church can ever be hurt from the outside. 
It can be hurt from the inside, and we're going to see that now in the next incident. But we now are introduced to the second deacon that God used in a marvelous way. Verse 5, and we have here Philip now becomes the chief witness abroad after the death of Stephen. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. The Lord Jesus says, You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now they've gone to Samaria. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now Philip had the sign gifts of the early church. Not everyone had them, just these in places of leadership, these that were taking the word out. And there came the day when these sign gifts disappeared. And you say, when did they disappear? They disappeared right after the apostles. And when the canon of Scripture was established, it's the doctrine now, and it hasn't anything to do with the sign gifts. Now will you notice verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. There was great joy in that city, the coming now of the gospel into Samaria, of all places. It brought great joy. This man was well received. Now we begin to discover that there was coming into the church as it grew so fast, there came in those that were actually not believers at all. They were really unbelievers, but they made a profession. And here is one of them. And I'm reading verse 9 in chapter 8. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. You can't help if you claim to have a sign gift. You can't help but do the thing that this man did, that you're some great one. And I hear today, oh, these folk are very humble. Well, humility is something you can put on like a garment, for that matter. And humility doesn't manifest itself of leading services where you are healing, supposedly, and that you are about the only one that's around that can do it, by the way. Now, that's giving out that you're some great one. Now, that was Simon. And notice verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Now, see, they felt like he was of God, even Simon the sorcerer. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And there are a great many people today bewitched. My friend, do not be witched by any man, by his power, even when he's giving out the Word of God. Don't look to man. Look to the Word of God, whether what he's saying is accurate. And look to God. Turn to him. When we get our eyes on man, we get our eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what had happened there in Samaria. Verse 12, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And now this fellow, Simon, and let me say this about him, Philip came in contact with him, and apparently he made a profession of faith under the ministry of Philip. And he's the first, I think, religious racketeer in the church, but he's unfortunately not the last one, and he professes to be a believer during that sweeping revival of Philip, and he goes through all the outward ritual. He believes, and he's baptized, and he becomes a friend of Philip. And somebody says, well, my, if that's all true, then wasn't he really saved then? Listen to this, verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He's exposed to Christianity, and he's impressed, though not converted. 
notice that there are others here that are professing, but that doesn't mean that they are saved. Now, this is a case of, shall I say, head knowledge or of just going along with the crowd. A great many people do that today. I've had quite a few letters from folk that have said this to me. Since I've been studying the Bible with you, I've begun to examine my own faith, whether it's a faith I got from somebody else, or whether I'm just falling along with someone else, or whether I genuinely myself have been converted. It's well to do that. Paul said, examine yourself. See whether you're in the faith or not. Now, this man, Simon, has all the outward trappings. When they examined him and said, do you believe in Jesus? He said, yes. And he was baptized. But, my friend, he's not saved at all. And notice verse 14. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now, when they heard that there was a great moving of the Spirit down in Samaria, they sent two of the apostles down there. They wanted to check on it. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, here are a great company of professing believers, and they had not been born again, for they were not baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit. They were not indwelt by the Spirit of God. They were not saved. Verse 16, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, just the outward. And that, my friend, never will make you a Christian, just to go through a ceremony. And now, notice, this gives us the background of why Simon was able to put over his racket here on the others. Now, he liked this idea of performing miracles. And I read now verse 17, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, that brought them into partnership with the apostles in the gospel, and they now believe in Christ. I think that Philip probably had not made all the conditions in the facts of the gospel. The Spirit of God had not yet come into that area. Now, another viewpoint that should be considered is this. It took an apostle to open up each one of these areas. Peter on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Peter and John in Samaria, Judea and Samaria. And Paul the apostle out to the Gentiles. It took an apostle to open up the world to the preaching of the gospel. I personally believe that is the most satisfactory explanation. Now will you notice, and when Simon saw that through laying on apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. This is verse 18, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this man, Simon, he wanted to pay for the gift. Why? Well, he's a religious racketeer. He's going to use it for profit. And he wants that. How many claims are made today by individuals that certain great miracles take place in their meetings, and they very humbly say they have nothing to do with it? Well, then, if you have nothing to do with it, then why do you permit that type of thing to continue to deceive the people? Bewitch is the word used here. And my friend, there have been religious racketeers around bewitching the multitudes from that day to this. That hurts the church more than anything else. Persecution from the outside didn't hurt it. It scattered it and actually was for the furtherance of the gospel. But when they got inside and were baptized, they hurt the church when they professed to be believers and were not believers. That's where the church has always been hurt. Jesus Christ was betrayed from the inside. He was betrayed by one of his apostles to his nation. His nation betrayed him to the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire crucified him. That's the way that it has happened, and today he's betrayed in the church from the inside. I don't think anybody outside the church can ever hurt the church. It's when they get on the inside. It's like the wooden horse brought into the city of Troy. That city was impenetrable. It was invulnerable 
until that wooden horse got on the inside. The devil started out persecuting the church, fighting it from the outside, decided that wouldn't work, then he joined it. And my friend, when he gets inside, that's when you have trouble. Oh, how many pastors can testify to that today? And there's some listening to me right now that I know are saying amen. But notice Simon Peter's answer to this man. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You see, money, money, money. That was the important thing to this man. Verse 21, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, that's the reason I said he's not converted. Simon Peter said he was not converted. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Now, Simon Peter says to him, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You can't make it any stronger than that, can you? friends, than this man Simon Peter did. Now verse 24, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, he doesn't ask to be prayed for that he might be saved. He just wants none of these things to happen to him. I do not know. I have no right to judge the man. I do not think he was ever saved. Verse 25, And they when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now the gospel, friends, is starting out to the ends of the earth. It's now left Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where the apostles will remain. There'll be a church there, but the center will soon move to Antioch. Then it'll move to Ephesus, then it will move down to Alexandria, then it will come up to Rome. The center of the church will begin to shift from now on, and today, well, I don't think there's any particular center of the church. It's gone to the ends of the earth today, and I believe that one of the finest vehicles to get it to the ends of the earth is the radio, a mechanical means today where we have fallen down probably as human beings, now radio can do what we, humanly speaking, could never have done. We come to a new section now, verses 26 to 40. We are brought into another part of the ministry of Philip. That in Samaria doesn't sound too good, does it? But the gospel went there, and many believed. There were many genuine believers, but this was given to show that evil was coming into the church. And in contrast to Simon the sorcerer, we are going to see this man Philip go down and lead an Ethiopian eunuch to Christ, and he was genuine. But notice verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, this area of Samaria is really north of Jerusalem, and now he's told to go way down south, by the way. And Gaza, it's over along the Mediterranean, and this was the normal route back down into Egypt and Ethiopia. And so he's on the way home, and he's been to Jerusalem. And Philip is to go down there now, having spoken to the multitudes in Samaria. He sent down to a desert, and when he was sent there, there was nobody there, but when he got there, here comes the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's to witness to him. We'll see that next time, and until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Today we saw the believers moving out of Jerusalem, going into Judea and Samaria. Well, in the next few days, we'll see the gospel moving towards the ends of the earth. And I'm so glad that you're continuing this same mission with us. As you pray and financially support through the Bible, we're taking God's whole word to the whole world. I count it as one of my greatest privileges in my life, and I know that many, many of you can say the same. So if you want to join us, just call 1-800-65-BIBLE or write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. 
And remember, you can always give online at ttb.org forward slash give. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm excited to see where the Lord takes us tomorrow. See you then. Our story on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too?